I work with clients to help them make better things. And I do packaging, and I save them lots of money. Three million for this company, really simple. You don't send little things out in big boxes. It's just wrong, fundamentally wrong. Um, I work with these brands. I've worked on really technical stuff like um, process flow mapping and understanding how you fill products. All that's really important because if you get it right, if you change the packaging, you change the amount of cheese waste that you're throwing away. What's got a massive carbon footprint? Anything dairy. But the, my main passion is I want to design better things. I don't want to design things by accountant. I don't want to get a price on something. I want to put a function on something. I don't want to design things by history. What did we do last time? Let's make it a bit better. No, if it's not broken, break it. Start again. But if we don't get the brief right, then we don't get the design right. Designers are really smart, but they sometimes don't ask enough questions. And I feel, it's a bit, I feel a bit sacrilegious saying that in, in this big temple of design today. I normally stand up and talk about Apple in the terms of philosophical, almost semi-religious way, as we all do. It's over. The love affair is finished. Because this is one of the world's most unrecyclable laptops, their new Retina Display MacBook Pro. Some really interesting things. I fix it, say, the display is fused to the glass, RAM is soldered to the board, it's non-upgradable, the battery is glued into the case, it's a minimum of a $200 upgrade. That's not what I'm buying into any, anymore. So got to move away from that, that system. Got to move away from that system. And it's, it's not good enough. I mean, Apple are lovely, but they, they create, they've always created aesthetic and, what's the word? Desire-based obsolescence. And now they've started and created functional obsolescence. And that's just not, not good enough. So we need to move on from that model. Consumers are now not just concerned with the, the volume of products that they buy, and some aren't even concerned about that, but also with the providence of materials. There's a piece of legislation in the States called the Conflict Materials Bill, which is in place now and will change the way we use electronics and the way we buy electronics, and it will definitely change the way we make electronics forever. Now, what I wanted to do was have a closer look at one particular supply chain or a supply map, okay? So, as I explained earlier, we all use high tech, we all sit there watching stuff on the telly, it's all internet enabled, it's 3D, you stick in a hard drive, it records, it becomes sky, it's brilliant, what can't it do? And we do it with our laptops on our knees. You'll have your phone in your pocket, it'll be buzzing you, telling you that you're really important, and you might have a really high-tech fridge. Samsung's new fridge is going to come out next year, I think. Got a screen on it. It'll have all kinds of technology built in so that it tells you when products go out of date. The things we've been talking about for years, it's now going to come into fruition. But what happens when it all breaks? When it becomes usurped, either functionally or through design or desire? What, what happens to all that stuff? Some of it gets rec recovered and recycled. Some of it, some of it doesn't. Some of it goes straight into landfill. And things are improving. We've got legislation in place, which although not perfect, is better than, than having nothing. But in the UK, we tend to recycle volume, not value. In Japan, it's much smarter. They'll recycle value. They'll take the smart materials out, all the rare earths, the things I'm going to talk about in a minute. We cannot let them slip through our fingers. We need to contain the periodic table. You all know, you've all heard of um, coltan, tantalite capacitors, yeah? Well, tantalite capacitors are found in pretty much every electronic pro device on the planet. They're incredibly thin. They're used for timer displays. They're used on CPU boards. And if, if you look at, at the, the supply chain, you can't help but use the word crazy. It is, it is a little bit bonkers. Now, coltan mainly comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's massive, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Absolutely colossal. It's one of the world's poorest countries, one of the world's richest countries in, in one go. It's a beautiful country, an amazing country. And like many countries that use the word democratic and republic, it probably isn't either of those things. But it's an astonishing place to be. But it's torn with war. It's been war-torn for many, many years. If any of you haven't seen a video called Falling Whistles, watch that when you get home. Really simple, elegant, description of the problems in this, in this part of the world. The DRC reportedly provides 14% of the world's coltan, but it, it doesn't. When you look at it in more detail, 
it's unregulated, and the vast majority of coltan is smuggled out of the DRC because of concerns over conflict materials. It's, it's smuggled out to places like Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Not that they're conflict-free either. So it moves out of the country. Uganda doesn't even have any coltan reserves, and yet it still sells coltan. And we don't, we don't know how, we don't know how this has happened. So some people estimate that 64% of this vital electronic ingredient in the world all comes from the DRC. That's, that's big, and we don't, we don't know that for certain. The income from this cross-border trade directly or indirectly feeds this conflict. It does, there's no way around it. Even if the companies are great, there's this kind of whole system built up around jealousy and manufacturing, extraction, almost kind of slave labor. It's a horrible system. And, and it's not fair, it's not fair at all. So the coal tongue gets mined, it gets smuggled out, and then it gets traded. So it comes out of the Democratic Republic, into Uganda, into Tanzania, to the port, where it gets shipped to Japan to make capacitors. So I'm trying to put a few arrows on the map to show you the movement of some of these goods. So off it goes to Japan. It's then mixed in with coal tongue from other sources, Australia, Brazil, and the USA. But remember, 64% comes from the DRC-ish. Now, why does it matter that this comes from the DRC? Why? Lots and lots of reasons. One, if you're a business and you've got to A, secure supply, and B, manage the conflict materials bill, those two things can, can cause quite an attrition between one another. So the conflict materials bill, you'll, you'll have to declare if you've bought product or materials from areas of conflict. And how can you have any viable CSR policy without understanding where your provenance sits? You, you can't, you, you, just, you just can't, you need to know everything. So buyers enter stage left, wanting to buy the tantalite that is now in Japan to make the capacitors, and they ship it to Taiwan where they make the capacitors. Not much of a journey, that's okay, we can probably allow that one. We then add in other materials, plastics, oils, a load of stuff bring, comes in from around the world. Add those to the map as well. We add in some more ores from Australia, maybe some bauxite from South Africa. They all come in. So those arrows go flying in as well. And it's not, never easy to trace where these things truly come from because the market is really complex. So then we've made the capacitors, but they're in the wrong country. They're in Taiwan. We make most of our stuff in China. So we ship it out to China. That's okay, that's only a small journey. Now, they get added to, to printed circuit boards. Now, they're really complex. They, they, they can be very simple, paper-filled phenolic boards, really simple electronic componentry, or, um, conductible adhesives. You don't even need conductible inks. You don't even need solder on some of them. Others are incredibly complex, costing well over 1,000, 2,000 pounds for, for one board. And then you add in Teflon, copper, tin, gold, lead, silver. All of these things get added in. So our map becomes loads more complex. Loads more stuff piling in all the time. Stuff from Poland, Kazakhstan, China. It'd be nice to see tin from Cornwall, wouldn't it, in that, in that slide? USA, New Caledonia, Chile. It all goes piling in and gets added into the board. And we also need more oil and more tantalum. So that gets thrown in as well. So we're getting, this, is just, this is just for a laptop, remember. We're getting quite a complex, a quite a complex map already. And then, there's the recycled materials. Some of those can be used in new products if they're segregated properly like they are in Japan. So then we add those things in, coming from the West and into, into the manufacturing. And we can't forget about water. A lot of the work I do now used to be on carbon footprinting. A lot of it now is on water footprinting, understanding how much water is used to make that chair in the process and where that water comes from. Because if that, if that chair's made in Wales, no scarcity of water in Wales, there just isn't. If that chair's made in, 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 in a China, where they've already eaten through fossil water reserves, fossil aquifers, this is a massive issue, because we're taking water that you could drink, and we're turning it into product and importing it into the UK. Well, that, that's ethically, that, that cannot be right. And so we need to be really cognizant of water. It's, it's the next big resource scarcity that we're gonna have. We need to be, and it's not about scarcity as much as it is about equity. So to make one laptop, requires 10,000 liters of water. This has a business knock-on. This isn't just about me ranting on about unfairness in the world. This has a business implication. It'll change where you cite things. Ask any of the big fizzy drinks manufacturers around the world, 
about water security. They'll tell you it's core to their business, it, it really is. So, then along come the big boys, the HPs, Dells, Acers, IBMs, Apples, all of them, and they want those PCBs, and they ship them to where they want them. So they, they're, they're the customers, they take the products, or the, or the PCBs, and they add them into wherever they want to go. They then chase it around the world with packaging, because every sub-assembly is packaged, because it has to be protected. That's the right thing to do. We need to protect the products that we've made, because that's where the money and the resource is. Packaging is a minor, minor issue relative to the raw materials in the product. And then there's all the other sub-assemblies. So all of these things compiling in, because they're not all made in one place. So finally, we've got our laptop. But it's in China. Uh, I live in Derbyshire. It's no use to me in China. I know the cloud's good, but it's not that good. So I've got to get that to me. So through trains, planes, automobiles, and ships, we dispatch the laptops and they ensure at our local, they, they, we ensure they arrive at our local store. So they move around the world once more. And because I'm not happy with my MacBook Pro or whatever, I then go out and buy more stuff. And what do I do with my old stuff? It goes back into the recycling stream. And we don't recycle value, we recycle volume in this country. And it's not good enough. Ford make 20% of their profits from selling cars. They make 80% of profits from the ongoing relationship that they have with you. You tell me that that kind of leasing relationship service-based business is bad. It's not, it, it works. We just need to change the way we think about it. But we need to go back to the fact that the products are not designed for recovery, recovery, recycling, and repair. Our waste systems don't help, I know that. The fact that we collect some things at curbside in one side of the street and not in the other side of the street because it's a different borough council, I appreciate that that is really frustrating and fundamentally wrong. But that's the system that we've got. That's the way our uh, democracy works. And this means that valuable and scarce materials are being mined, used, and disposed. And the resources are going to dwindle. And the recycling is not good. To get metals and valuable things out of inflammable stuff, the quickest way is to burn it. And all of this adds extra stress into the, um, into the ecosystem. If we don't have materials, we can't make stuff. I've said it about four times today. If we can't make stuff, we can't make money. That model's broken and, and, and it has to change. Getting hold of these materials, it's only going to become more difficult. And when you look at some of the, 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 the raw material use rates, it's absolutely staggering how fast we've burnt through some things, literally burnt through some things. Now, there is legislation in place in the States. It may change things. It may not. I don't know. Watch falling whistles and decide for yourself whether things need, need changing. But it's really important that we, we change the way we design products from having these materials available for other products. It's really, really important. So that is the source map for your laptop. It takes 500 kilograms of material, shipping around the globe, losing bits, bit by bit by bit, to make a two and a half kilogram product. Even the best recycling systems in the world aren't going to mean that's massively efficient. We're going to lose loads and loads of that material. We call this an ecological rucksack, and there's a lot of work done on this, looking at different products and, and how that varies. It's really important that, we, that we're cognizant of this and that we think very carefully about trying to keep things alive longer rather than buying new. But of course, the challenge when you're keeping things alive longer is you want the more efficient, energy efficient things, and that, that, that then creates its own dimension. So to put into context, it's that much stuff to make a product of that scale. That, that's all to scale. Okay, that, that's staggering, so there's a lot of waste in there. I don't need to say any more. We need to do things really differently. The great recovery program on the stand next door is um, instrumental in changing the way that we think about things and is launching a competition with the Technology Strategy Board with, a, I think the technical term is a shed load of cash to help people design things, businesses design things better in a collaborative way. So you need to pop onto the store next door Get the details of the competition and please get involved. Mm -hmm.